much, Greg, John, Andrew. We have about 20 minutes for questions with this panel, and then we have much more time uh, until 1 p.m. to continue discussion, open dialogue. So, um, hands, I'll start over here. First of all, what an amazing and thought-provoking morning of presentations. So I'm very excited because there's, I've had a question I've wanted answered for about two months. So I'm going to put it to the panel. And that is, very recently I've discovered the cognitive science of religion, where social psychology meets cultural anthropology. And I'm fascinated to learn that the vast majority of, of humanity believes in something higher, some luminous source, some theism, and only a tiny minority overall are atheistic. So here's my question, and I can ask this, because I'm not from the States, uh, and I'm not American, I don't live here. I come here and I see, uh, my question is about leadership and higher agency. I see the likes of pop star Taylor Swift, Feeling stadia after stadia with a goddess-like following. I see a certain politician called Mr. Trump, and we, we needn't go into any of, of the belief systems around either Taylor Swift or Donald Trump. But the, to me, uh, this is an anthropological question, I come here and I'm like, what is the magnetism? What is the religio going on here? What is it in American society that these two quite different figures in different contexts seem to be holding such Force. So that, that's, a, that's a, a question I've been wondering about. So I'd love to hear any input on that. You know, um, thank goodness that Taylor Swift opposes Trump. <laughs> much to his dismay. Um, I think they appeal to two very different um, parts of the collective sensibility. And Taylor Swift, I have a 15-year-old granddaughter, and in her world, Taylor Swift is big. Um, and I, I've asked where that was coming from with my son. And, and he gave insight just in terms of that she's been able to kind of keep a um, a relationship with her her many fans, and her fans tend to be of a certain age, typically of a certain gender, and uh, I think she represents a kind of um, ideal image uh, for at a certain point in a in a maturational process. It's something that happens in popular art, popular arts all the time. Trump's a whole other phenomenon. Um, we, we would need a whole weekend to discuss the factors that are going into his bizarre um, emergence into the position that he's in. I'll put my cards on the table by saying I, I think there's a there's a demonic uh, complex that's taken over a uh, good part of the country for many reasons. Usually it has to do with trauma. And, uh, and it makes one um, distort perceptions, uh, deny certain realities, uh, and become quite vociferous and expert at it. But I think um, we're looking at a very powerful moment of the takeover of a certain kind of archetypal complex in the collective psyche that is not, it's different then, but it's not completely unlike what happened in Germany in the 30s. Um, and Jung wrote a very insightful essay on that called Votan that's worth reading in that light. Anyway, those are a couple of thoughts. Not to deny the pronounced obvious differences between Taylor Swift and Trump, I wouldn't mind having dinner with the first. I would not want to have dinner with the second, for example. Um, but um, I think they, uh, I think they do share a common uh, 
causation. Uh, I have been arguing extensively for the fact that we're in a meaning crisis, that we have a worldview in which we are a whole, in which we do not belong. And when your worldview eradicates you, you are hungry for connectedness, and you are hungry for, I'm going to use this in a technical sense, in Frankfurt sense, you're hungry for a way to cut through the bullshit to get back to connected to what's real. You're hungry for wisdom and religio. And you're also hungry for agape. You're hungering for a justification to be ontocentric rather than egocentric and participate profoundly in the making of persons. You're, we're hungering for that and we're in a worldview and a culture that is starving us. Now most of that meaning making and insight and overcoming of self-deception is not happening. It's not taking place at the formal theoretical level. I talk about four kinds of knowing. And most of that connectedness religio is being generated at the procedural level, at the perspectival level, at the participatory level. And you need practices. I often tell people, don't tell me what you believe, tell me what you practice. Because then I know what your religio is. And we used to have something that honed, please note that word, honed a worldview that legitimated complex living ecologies and practices for enhancing religio, for overcoming self-deception, for cultivating wisdom, for affording the agopic creation of persons, and it was called religion. I'm not here to advocate for any religion, and there are viable and important critiques. I don't want to throw out everything that modernity did. But when we threw out the bathwater, we threw out a lot of the baby. And so we're hungry. And so we look for pseudo-religious surrogates, pseudo-communities, pseudo-gods, pseudo-worldviews. And not to besmirch Taylor Swift, she is what she is, and she's honest, I think. Right? I think she represents something not good, which is the reduction of the sacred to celebrity. And the participation in that celebrity of un, undue adoration. She's an idol. And of course, Trump. A, a lot of the mainstream media doesn't get Trump. Trump is a religious phenomenon. Trump is a religious phenomenon, he's a cult. He knows in whatever incohate manner that he can say and do whatever he wants because he's an enacted symbol. And America has been a religious civil war from the beginning. You had two founding movements. You had Puritans, who represent a kind of religious fundamentalism of their day, and you have the revolution, which is driven by enlightenment philosophy. And America has always carried this. And I can say this because I'm a Canadian. <laughs> and, and, you know, and you guys have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we have peace, order, good government. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think there's always been that religious tension in America, the, the, the always near to the surface civil war, religious civil war, and then the meaning crisis has amped it up, like on methamphetamines, and that's why you get Trump and Taylor Swift. Let me respond to the first element of your question, since they've covered the second. I think I heard you say, you know, we all, or many people believe in a higher power, some sort of theism. And so, to connect it back to Ian's work, it is a question about, say, the kind of values, the primordiality of values that I'm speaking of, what theological or metaphysical framework do you embed them into? Theism would be one answer, various kinds of theism. Pantheism would be another, that's John Leslie, that's Philip Goff, that's a number of others, depending on how they define their pantheism. Panentheism is another that Matt and I have written about, that. Many in the Whitehead community, Ian included, have spoken about in a profound way that 
is going to preserve a kind of relationality that seems to be lost to either theism on the left or pantheism on the right. Atheism is an option. So you can notice that several times Thomas Nagel, admittedly, as he says, I just don't want the universe to be the kind of universe that has a god. Right? He admits this. Of course, the kind of god he's imagining is, well, probably one we wouldn't want either. <laughs> but value remains. And it's an open metaphysical question as to whether or not there's a god-shaped metaphysical whole. Can you just have free-floating values and possibilities in the universe? Where are they? Can we ask that question? Part of the answer Ian gives is that they're not just sort of independent out there somewhere. They're, well, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, qualitative dimensions of consciousness. Right? So that mind and value come together in some deep sense to support each other mutually. So I know that's an open discussion, but theism, pantheism, atheism, panentheism, there's other isms, transpantheism, Roland Faber, etc. But it's not a close question as to how you make sense of how values can be, and not only be, but be efficacious in the world. I would say the same thing about possibilities. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to be very bad. And, and just respond to some of the things that you, you said, all three of you. Um, there were three things that came to mind. One was this story of Calvin that I didn't know, this little boy who sees the universe. And it put me in mind of a, a saying of the wonderful Peter Cook, who was a British comedian. Um, when I look out at night at the wide expanse of the stars and the whole glittering heavens, I realize how unimportant they are. <laughs> uh, the reason I say that is, of course, not that they are, that they are ultimately unimportant, but that we get over some people have an idea that the sublime is a way of humiliating ourselves. It is not. It is a way of exalting ourselves. Because we realize that we are part of that cosmos. And that's the bit that Peter Cook wouldn't have seen. And I'm told by um, a devout Jew that certain Jews carry in their pockets two pieces of paper. And one says, for you, the whole of this wonderful cosmos was created. And the other says, in respect of this whole cosmos, you are but a speck of dust. I mean, holding those two together as often seems to me a good place to be. And it, the reason I mention it is that a lot of people are overwhelmed by the question, what do we do? You know, they ask, what can we do? I'm just so small, you know. And the, the world, they sometimes add, is so small in this, this realm of space. Well, um, setting aside that Sir John Polkinghorne, famous English um, both theologian and cosmologist, um, points out that in order to get to a planet that has life like this, you would need a universe the size and the age that it exactly is. Um, so the fact that it is large and it has existed for a long time is not a reason for despair. But also, the whole question of size is a very left hemisphere question. How big? When the lover says, my love is as broad as the skies and as deep as the ocean, how deep is that? You know, <laughs> it's a sort of autistic question. And I think that the, the way in which I would see it is that we need to start within here. And I can't tell you how big that is. It's potentially infinite. And we're not asked to sort the whole of our society, never mind the whole world and the cosmos. We're asked to do the thing we can, and it begins from a step inside the heart. The second thing I wanted to pick up on, if I may, is the idea of belonging. I think this is an absolutely profound question. And we've done away with a religio in which people can find themselves at home. We've given away, or, or done away, with a society in which people feel together with others. And we, we've tried to make um, the whole cosmos seem to have no meaning that would allure us. But belonging, it comes from a root in, in Anglo-Saxon, langian, which is to stretch out. And it means however far you go from home, you feel that urge to return to it. And that is what we're feeling the urge to, but we don't know what that home is anymore. And as G.K. Chesterton said, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. And that's the world in which we find us. And the, front, the third point I wanted to uh, make is in relation to your um, talk, Andrew, um, where you talked about the whole cosmos being possibly um, a response to uh, the fulfillment of value. 
And I'd just like to say this about life, because I used to think that there was an enormous chasm between the inanimate and the living, and of course it was a very, very important distinction. But it is not actually a chasm. There are elements in the inanimate universe that do what life does, but very, very, very slowly and very, very, very minimally. It responds to certain things in the way that life does. But life does it billions of times, both faster and more deeply. And so the expression of value requires the creation of creatures who can reflect value. A. N. Whitehead said, why is there life? If it's really about permanence, the secret to permanence is never to have been alive at all. Be a rock. <laughs> um, but life, and even the most ancient life, uh, had much better survival chances than, than we do. There are actinobacteria at the base of the ocean, single examples of which may be half a million years old. And yet, poor old Homo sapiens, 70 years. So it can't be anything to do with that. I think it's to do with what has caused us a great deal of suffering, but a great deal of exaltation, and a sense of depth with the divine, is our ability to respond to those values, the good, the beautiful, the true, and the sacred. And that's why there is life at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talks. They were very, I'm right here, <laughs> very inspiring. And uh, I keep circling back to this idea of vocation. And I really feel that a conference like this, um, obviously we have all these concepts and facts and arguments swimming in our heads, but what I take away most of all is a sense of vocation, a calling. What are we doing here? Where are we going? I don't have a clear answer to those, but I have a much clearer sense of vocation from this. So thank you. And. Um, from that sense of vocation, I have to say to John, so I loved your talk, and I'm completely on board with what you're doing, but I totally disagree with your reading of Aristotle, and I promise you it's not the right reading of Aristotle. I love Nishida, he's also incorrect on this, and Bergson says the same thing, he's, you know, Bergson's in my heart, but uh, he's totally wrong. I spent my dissertation, uh, Aristotle's Theory of Dynamics, disproving this view of substance and all of this in Aristotle. So, I can refer that to you more if you're interested, but yeah, I have to throw that out. Well, I can't respond to an argument in absentia, um, so I don't know what to say about that. Um, I don't need the interpretation of Aristotle to be right, because the people that interpreted Aristotle, the nominalists, did what I said they did, and that's not all I need for my argument. Okay? to say, and this would be an interesting conversation for another time that we might have, which is that nominalism arises for a number of reasons, and one of them has to do with Aristotle. But it also, there is just a very strong theological reason to want to give God uh, such over um, omnipotence over his creation that uh, and nominalism seemed to serve that because no longer would all these archetypal forms and universals of, uh, have their own goods that they're enacting, but now, but only God decides what's good. And, and it was seen by the nominalist medieval theologians to, in their effort to elevate the transcendent above the imminent, uh, that, the, that nominalism would serve that, little realizing that nominalism was a step to materialism um, and, and uh, the end of their, their Christendom. Anyway, it's, it's a, a longer, it'd be an interesting conversation to have, at least, anyway. I don't disagree with that at all, and, but I do think that that move is also born out of a commitment to seeing uh, God as the single substantial source of all properties, right? So I think those two are bound together. They belong together in a pernicious sense of belonging. Yeah. Or, no, we'll talk later. Yeah. I'm happy to mediate a YouTube dialogue between yeah. Yeah. So, we're going to do a question online and then there's a question over here. Yeah, this online question comes from Sean Kelly. Sean states I'm wondering if people could comment on the relatively autonomous role of both gender in parentheses, patriarchy, and political economy, in parentheses, capitalism, and the evolution of consciousness, a role which, though clearly bound up with the brain hemispheres, must also feed back on the latter. 
In other words, if the hemispheres create worlds, to adapt one of Rick's favorite phrases, the world also creates the hemispheres. You know, Sean, I'm, uh, I'm reluctant to get into such a complex issue. Um, I, I totally agree with you about the recursive relationship between um, between worldviews creating worlds or epistemic stances creating uh, worlds and then the worlds are also creating the epistemic stances in a feedback loop. No question about that. And there's no question that patriarchy and gender and so forth are are major factors at work in almost everything we've been talking about and also, as you say, capitalism. Um, but to parse out the, the specific ways in which male and female, masculine and feminine, even those are, are two different sets of categories overlapping, uh, play out, I just feel like um, I certainly couldn't do justice to it in a three-minute response to you. And since I'm your fellow faculty member, uh, I'll look forward to a longer conversation. <laughs> uh, I don't feel I have the expertise to answer that question. And I try not to, uh, which is a, pro, uh, a besetting danger in the social media world, to speak beyond my expertise. That's why Ian puts on his uh, yeah, perspective here. Why don't we move on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you. Yeah. Well, Probably one. all of us in this room live for these kinds of conversations. So thank you very much. I have a question for Andrew, but I will frame it within the wider discourse that's been going on. And someone said, you know, your worldview is eradicating you. And it's difficult to be the newspaper or the, the news these days and to say, my worldview has eradicated me or somebody else's worldview was eradicating me. Because we feel that we're being eradicated and that's not an overstatement. So the framework for my question to Andrew, again before I get there, is a distinction that Cantwell Smith makes in the be meaning and end of religion in terms of the etymological roots of religion, which are re religio, which is binding, and religare, which is the way that you do something, the care in which you do something, with which you do something. So if you focus only on the first etymological difference, then I think you're ignoring what Cantwell Smith discovered and why he advocated that religion had to go. And he was trying to, in this way, get us back to Schleiermann who said that religion in this way are binding principles that have been emerged from traditions and they cannot be absolutely true because they're human created. Whereas the experience of feeling inextricably interwoven with all of life, which is an innate capacity of human nature, is dispositional if you have, I'll use another tradition, an eightfold path. <laughs> so the function of a spiritual community through practice is to create your dispositional standpoint so that when there's anger or rage or sexuality or whatever, your, your disposition gives you the ability, he says, to pause, which he says is the basis of human freedom. We get to pause when we're triggered and decide how we're going to express what's been triggered emotionally. And thus we need the disposition of really glory, caring. Now, to Andrew's wonderful delineation of your thought, I just love it. So here's my question to you. Okay, you say that uh, value facts are primitive facts in their own right. So that's one claim, primitive facts. Second claim, existence is an achievement of value. There's a little wobbly there. I'm suggesting, perhaps, that value facts 
as you're almost framing it, but not quite, which is why I think it works brilliant. But the way you're laying it out, it's as if you're making value subject to the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So my question to you is this, that you're calling for dispositional axiology, which again, Buddhist, Schleiermacher, others, really dare, is the way in which we do something which requires right community, right practice, right action. That disposition, and William James, right, took a trip, nitrous oxide, to see opposites meet. That dispositional state. That dispositional state, as you know, from the standpoints of Kyoto Buddhism, is shunyata, is nothingness, which is why they have a far more nuance under delineation of the phenomenal logic phenomenology of Heidegger and Husserl because they say, sorry, the West just doesn't get what nothingness is. It's not empty. So it seems to me that you are moving brilliantly toward your dispositional axiology, which is no thing, the multitude out of which emerges through interference, what's this, a compressive. Can I just say penguin? <laughs> Thank you, Ten David. I mean, there, there's a lot there, so I will, will not be able to respond to all of it. Maybe just three points. So the claim that values are primitive facts, right? and I was quoting Phil Goff there. But this is also the claim of being the, the ontological primitives. Um, do we, I, I don't think we want to reify them. And so part of what where why that fallacy of misplaced concreteness would come into play here is that we're reifying abstractions, yeah. right? We're making concrete what is fundamentally not. Yeah. And he sort of critiques the tradition for doing this. So I, I do think we want to be careful not to reify values or possibilities, et cetera. We need to embed them in a framework of metaphysical coherence. And again, that's a step where I think we make um, certain theological moves, arguably conceptually, whether it's panentheism, et cetera. You made a comment also about existence being achievement of value. Um, it, yeah. And I think what I would say there just briefly is that the whole divide between fact and value, at least in Whitehead's scheme, disappears. Um, and he admires the romantic poets for this quite a, quite a bit. Chapter 5 in Science in the Modern World is a beautiful phrase of the romantic poets who we're protesting on behalf of value. So I think what he means, at least, when achievement is a, or a, when existence is an achievement of value, is that it's an achievement of a kind of harmony. Uh, the many become one are increased by one. What's achieved in the many becoming one is a, is a harmonious, intense achievement. And that's an achievement of value, at least at an at a ascetic level. And so in his early Harvard lectures, he talks about the world being about the becomingness of values. It's values that are becoming. So. I know that doesn't begin to get into all that you were saying, but let's chat afterward. How about that? Great. Just the one comment about dispositions. Just oh, thank you, thank you. Yes. Okay, so her comment about dispositions, and I totally agree with that. I was giving that indication at the very end that we cannot just hold these propositionally, however nice they feel. We have to channel them somehow into dispositional orientations. And I think small groups. Yeah, that, that has been this theme that has come back several times is the way in which you do that. Religious small groups, spiritual small groups, various forms of small groups where you channel and live out those, well, live out the axiology, right? Let it not be just a merely possible theoretics, great. Let it channel into practice. That's what wisdom is, arguably. You can know all sorts of things and still be uh, an asshole. <laughs> if you don't channel what you know in the form of value into the way you live, I don't think you're yet wise. But thank you. Yeah. Right, it says every concrescence is a social effort that involves the entire universe. Mm -hmm. We can repeat that in these small groups in microcosm. So we're going to have one more question, and then we're going to get a break for 10 minutes, and then we're going to come back, and you can ask your questions that I know. <laughs> Coming off of your social effort, this is um, primarily for you, John, but anybody, please. 
as they leave this august group and re-enter the real world of trying to safeguard and protect the future of our, our numerous five schools of, of five programs of psychology of our work of our graduates who are receiving headlines and um, promotional efforts every day from regenerative AGI or whatever we're looking at. They counter your pillars that you presented so beautifully of implications and rules and everything you know, supporting relevance with this one bizarre comment that Okay, the human brain has 100 billion neurons, but we're at a place of 1 million now. So it's all just a matter of scale. And as we scale this from 1 million to approximate that human brain, we too will have relevance in our pocket. So please, we, we need something to answer these folks. Um, so that is to turn a difference in kind, a qualitative difference, into a mere difference of quantity. Um, which, which is, uh, as I try to argue, that these processes, because they presuppose relevance realization, just making them faster and more complex is not going to generate relevance realization because they are incapable of doing that because they fundamentally presuppose it. Um, and that's why these machines, and I think the right word for them, are parasites. They are parasitic on us. That's why they represent no scientific advance. And making them more complex is not going to lead to a difference in kind. It'll just mean their parasitic abilities will become more pervasive and powerful. And that was part of the horror uh, appropriately delivered to us by Zach's talk. And um, I think that um, just, I, I'm, not, I'm not attributing anything to you. I think the framing of the question, but that just, it, 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 it just, it bespeaks the performative contradiction mm -hmm. that it is coming from. I know. I'm just repeating how they say it to me. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so it's... Now, what I want to make very clear um, is I've been talking to a lot of people inside, and I can't reveal most of their names because they need to remain anonymous, but they are trying to bring this wider sapiential framework to bear on the Christian, the question, I should say, of AGI. And so there is, and it's weird, so many people have come to me from that community because of the advent of these machines. And they realized, wait, this is taking us away from something profound, profoundly, they, they have a sense that something is profoundly missing, but they know that their conceptual grammar and their theoretical vocabulary can't get them to articulate what's missing. <coughs> can, I, can I say one thing to Andrew? I'm going to break the rules. Of, I'm going to ask him a question. Which is, I thought your talk was excellent, but I want you to clarify about the hierarchies. Because it seems to me um, that you know, some of these, the way people organize their ultimacies seem to vary. Um, whether or not you take this to be accurate, and there's some dispute here, obviously. Uh, but, you know, the, the Kyoto School says that the West has prioritized actuality and the East has prioritized potentiality. Or you can even look in the history of, right, of the West. We, we had emanation ontologies that were predominant. And now we're in emergence. Um, I think the late, the late Neoplatonists realized that both of, that there are symmetrical problems for both of these. And if you try to privilege one of these over the other, you get into problems. And so there seems to be a wide variety, and, and I can speak to others. I just hope that's going to. There seems to be a wide variety around which people build hierarchies of ultimacy and value. And I wonder what that means to you. Thanks, Sean. <clears throat> um, right, so does actuality come first? Does potentiality come first? Do we, are we moving from the ground up, from the top down? I think the way you include all of those as implicating each other is precisely through relationality, mm -hmm. as, as I've argued in my, in my text. 
So sometimes, for example, why it gets critiqued as ontological principle is that all reasons are reasons of actuality. It's a statement of ultimate actuality as a context of metaphysics. And some say, well, he's just ignoring potentiality. No. The other side of the ontological principle is that the things which are temporal arise by their participation in the things that are eternal. Possibility. Possibility and potentiality belong. But we don't know their relationship. That's partly what I try to get at. Whatever God is, a necessary being of some kind is a synthesis of the possible and the actual in some way. Now, that takes elsewhere, but so I do think relationality is a way to try to, is to cut through those different approaches. Um, and your other comment was, remind me. No, that's it. I mean, what, I think what you're saying is that, if I understand you correctly, there's sort of, uh, we can do a trans hierarchical thing in which we realize that all of these different hierarchical formulations converge on relationality as, as the ultimate. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, I fully agree. So when it comes to hierarchy of values, that's a tough, a tough one, I think. And hierarchy is a lang is language that people don't like these days. Maybe continuum, maybe spectrum, et cetera. But I guess what I'm trying to get at in speaking of the hierarchy, and I agree about the relational component, the hierarchy of values, if I lift the tablecloth, everything comes with it everything maybe falls off the table. I think value is something like that. If anything has value, you're in trouble. All values come with it, higher and lower, etc. We can debate which values are higher and lower. Our cultures disagree, but that there's a difference between those values that are higher and lower, I think, is presupposed by our practice, even if we deny it in theory. Thank you, gentlemen. So, I can't promise that we can hold eternity in an hour, but we still have an hour left. <laughs> Take a 10-minute break, and let's come back for our final hour. <laughs> 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 <laughs>